Welcome back to another episode of the Sports Religion YouTube channel. Today we will be doing a full 32 team first round mock draft on the PFF Pro Football Focus Mock Draft Simulator. I believe that this is the best mock draft simulator you can use to simulate what might happen on draft night and it's definitely something that I've used a lot over the last couple of weeks in trying to decide what teams might potentially do on you know in about a month when the draft happens so with that let's get right into it and the Chicago Bears are leading off the order um, what a trade by Ryan Poles to get this team back into the first round pick you know basically fleecing the Panthers for their best receiver and an opportunity at a generational quarterback like this so there's no question about who's being drafted first we all know Caleb Williams is going to be the quarterback of the Chicago Bears next year and Bears fans have plenty of reason to be excited about this. It, there's nothing to be said about his level of play or the upside that he has. I mean, every major analyst knows this guy is a can't-miss prospect at quarterback, and moving off of Justin Fields and getting you know draft capital in return from Pittsburgh is exactly what they needed to do here. So with that, we'll go into number two, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the commander's are going to go for a quarterback, and I think that quarterback is going to be J.J. McCarthy. There's been many articles coming out recently that have explained how NFL GMs believe that the Washington front office is heavily invested in J.J. McCarthy, and I know this is not what a lot of Commanders fans might want or a lot of NFL fans might agree with, but I would not be shocked at all here if they take J.J. McCarthy there's been so much buzz around him recently, you know, just rising up team's draft boards. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't act surprised if he goes this high. And, you know, this is this is more me trying to predict what the commanders might do. I don't necessarily believe he's a better player than Drake May. I don't necessarily believe he's a more impactful and more dynamic player than Jaden Daniels. But I do think that situationally, this is what the commanders could end up doing on draft night, and it's not going to shock me if it happens. So be prepared for that if you're a commanders fan, and you know you might end up with this this high level, high upside developmental quarterback who's not necessarily going to be ready day one to be a superstar, but you know he's got all of the traits, all the physical tools, all the arm talent to be that guy going forwards if you can surround him with the proper infrastructure. So. That's, that's kind of an interesting way to think about it, but I, I strongly believe that the Commanders could very well do that. So the Patriots on the board at three, I think are also going to be looking for a quarterback, and I'm going to give them Jaden Daniels here. I think that the Jacoby Brissett signing may be a bit of a kind of foresight in the future of what the, Pan of what the Patriots would like to go towards their QB, and obviously... Brissett isn't in their long-term plans, but they wanted a reliable veteran who's been around to transition into the next regime at quarterback, and I think Patriots fans are all tired of seeing Bailey Zappi take the field. I mean, they need to have a difference maker back there, so what better way to do that than Jaden Daniels? The guy went off last season and showed why he's he can be one of the best. I think that they need to do a better job, though, of building that offensive line around him. They don't really have good options at left tackle right now, so they're definitely going to need to invest in that uh, with some of their later picks if they want to keep him upright and healthy because we know Jaden Daniels is prone to taking a lot of shots. You, we all saw in the Ole Miss game he got absolutely flattened by that, that safety running downhill. So, I mean, if the Patriots really want to keep – keep him upright. They've got to invest in the O-line with their next set of draft picks. So the Cardinals at four, I'm actually going to propose a trade um, with the Vikings to come up here because there's been a lot of buzz about the Cardinals being willing to trade down and actually acquire more draft capital, which they've been kind of stockpiling picks the last couple of years. So you know what's to say they won't do that again? I know Marvin Harrison Jr. is sitting there and that's a guy you you would more often than not take. But the Cardinals might be in a situation where they're kind of happy with what they have and would be willing to trade down for more capital, especially with a team that has another first-round pick like the Vikings. 
So here I'm going to request 11 and 23 from the Vikings. That's to me what it would take to get up this high. And you know, you might even want additional pieces as well. We'll put four on the board here for them. But you know, you can trade with a variety of teams like that. But you know, I'm also going to be looking at what kind of players maybe I could get if I'm the Cardinals here. And, you know, a guy I would want back would be Josh Metellus. He's a young physical safety who really had a good season last year after not showing, you know, much his first couple of years. But if you can get a young player like this who's still on a cheap deal, you know, I'm all for that. And especially with the Cardinals, you know, to make this trade even more likely to happen, the Vikings should definitely look to throw in one of these later picks as well. I mean, they just... You know, you don't necessarily, you're not going to accomplish too much by having this many late round picks in one. So, I mean, you could package one of them next year or you could package, you know, two or three of these late round picks. But I'm thinking that this is, you know, this is a package that would be what it takes to get up to four. And it doesn't have to be Josh Metellus. It could be another young player that the Cardinals deem would work well. But we're going to do this trade and... um assign the Vikings here, Drake May. I mean, can you imagine what Drake May would do in Kevin O'Connell's offense? He's the best at throwing over the middle, in my opinion, in this draft class. And he's got incredible vision, and his ability to, to lure the safeties into spots they don't want to be in order to make a throw is incredible. You can see that every game. I mean, it's on the 2022 tape as well as as last year so. Yeah, with that, the Vikings get their quarterback of the future, and the NFC North is looking pretty scary in terms of quarterback future once the Lions decide what they want to do, whether that's, you know, moving off of Goff or whatever. But, yeah, I and mean, that leaves the Chargers at five with an obvious choice. Marvin Harrison Jr., you just lost your top receivers in free. I mean, they traded Keenan Allen and basically cut Mike Williams for nothing, got nothing in return, so... Why not draft the best receiver in this draft? You know, that's some exciting stuff. Having Herbert throw to this type of receiver and this caliber, in all respect to Mike Williams, but he's nowhere near what Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to bring the second he steps on that field. So, you know, that's what better way to, to work around Justin Fields than drafting Marvin Harrison. And there's going to be a lot of storylines because Jim Harbaugh is their head coach. And, you know, his, his team is drafting an Ohio State player this high. But that's just that's what's best for the Chargers. You need that receiver, in the, especially at drafting five. They're going to get a lot of offers, too, from other teams that might want to move up to this pick and grab Marvin Harrison if this were to be the order on draft night. So the Giants at six are interesting because I think they're firmly... They firmly believe that they can get another year out of Daniel Jones, as dumb as it sounds, but we've seen enough. We know what Daniel Jones is, and if that offensive line isn't elite, he's not going to be anything special. And I personally don't think the Giants have done enough on the offensive line to make him dramatically better. And so for that reason, just just based on the contract alone, he's going to be a Giant next year, and he's going to be starting for them. So... Why not surround him with playmakers and take Malik Neighbors and get the best receiver here? There's a lot of experts that actually think Malik Neighbors could be better prospect-wise than Marvin Harrison. I personally don't see that, but with how he ran at his pro day, a 4-3-5 at the LSU pro day, like that turns a lot of heads. And you know his ability to get separation and be open all the time, it's pretty incredible. So the Giants can't flaw them at all there if they were to take Malik Neighbors you know, instead of Joel, because I really think they like what they have with Andrew Thomas on the left side of that line. And, you know, they just brought uh, the Raiders right tackle over. So, you know, they've done stuff at tackle that they they firmly believe in. You know, Giants fans love Andrew Thomas. He's just got to be available more often and be healthy. And then, you know, hopefully the rest of that offensive line can hold up because they signed John Runyon to a pretty sizable deal as well. And, you know, drafted John Michael Schmitz, and they quite frankly didn't get enough out of John Michael Schmitz last year. So a lot of the Giants' success will be dependent on this offensive line next year. And, you know, 
it'll be interesting to see what they end up deciding to do with the rest of the draft as well, if they address that or not. So with that, let's move on to the uh, the Titans. I think a popular pick here is Joe Alt for many people. However, I've been hearing what you know their GM, Rand Carthen, has said repeatedly in his press conferences, and that's he wants to get more dynamic. He wants younger players. He wants faster players. And to me, that doesn't really sound like you're drafting an offensive lineman at seven when you talk that way. You know, you're looking for a dynamic playmaker. And to me, that's Brock Bowers. And he's going to fit so nicely in with that receiving core that they've they've built steadily. Like, they have D-Hop. They just invested in Kelvin Ridley for the next couple of years. And, you know, they hopefully can get Traylon Burks to become what they thought he was in college. And, you know, if that's the case, then you have three three really good receivers. I think, you know, certainly D-Hop could be getting getting older, but he's still a phenomenal playmaker for them. Nothing's changed. He's still the same D hop that we've always we've always known. And, you know, adding Brock Bowers would give you that that difference making tight end that the Titans currently don't have. And, you know, Chigazem Okonkwu is a nice piece. He's really been someone that has flown under the radar, but also, you know, based on some of his stats and metrics he had two years ago, he he could have potentially also have big numbers in this offense. So you know, I think adding Brock Bowers just gives Will Levis another target to throw to, and that's exactly the message that was put out by the Titans' front office. So I fully expect them to look at a playmaker like that or one of the receivers that potentially could fall to them at 7. So with the Falcons at 8, I'm actually going to propose another trade here, and the team that I think should trade to this spot is the Broncos. I think that they're in an arms race with the Raiders to find their next quarterback. And considering both teams are drafting right next to each other at 12 and 13, I think that one of them needs to make a move into this spot. Because I don't know that the Broncos have the picks to be able to trade up into the top four and grab one of those top four quarterbacks. So... For me, I think the Broncos give the Falcons 12 if they can and then do a pick swap like this. And, you know, if I'm the Broncos, I'd want to give some of these late round picks as well. And, you know, what what it, you you got to ask yourself what it's going to take to get to eight. And it's, it's definitely going to be packaging a lot of these picks and maybe even one next year. So, for example, we'll just try this and, you know, there's no guarantee that that's what the package would look like if they were to trade. But I think, you know, the price that teams will pay for a franchise quarterback, especially with the window the Broncos have now with Sean Payton, you know, I think Sean Payton could be a great mentor to a young quarterback. So I'm going to take the best quarterback left, and that's that's easily Bo Nix. I think the production speaks for itself. The college football experience speaks for itself. And, you know, the leadership traits that he has – would be great for the Broncos if they were to go in a different direction from Russ. So I have them taking Bo Nix here at eight and getting their quarterback of the future. And, you know, they'll still have some picks to play with too and kind of try to build around him and get some more playmakers. So the Bears here at nine is another interesting scenario where I would probably take a, def- a defensive lineman or a pass rusher here and truly unlock that front seven. Because right now it's kind of Montez Sweat and who else? Like, who else are you scared of on that defensive line? It's, you know, it's Gervon Dexter and Zach Pickens in the middle. And they're both really young players who have a lot of tread left on their tires. But, you know, I don't think that defensive, you know, in terms of defensive linemen, either of those guys are really game wreckers yet in their careers. So would you look at Byron Murphy here or... You know, I think I think of the freaky stuff that could happen if you had Dallas Turner on the other side of Montez Sweat. That would be pushing one of the most athletic edge rush duos in the league because we all know that Montez Sweat is a freak athlete already, and Dallas Turner tested out of his mind at the Combine. So for me, I, I would really look at one of those two players here. However, the media has really been mocking Adunze to the Bears here at 9 just to get that crazy trio of receivers um, going in, in Chicago and 
you know, look out if they do that because that offense will have all all the tools in the world to be one of the top offenses in the league. So it I'm really curious at what the Bears do, but I think the best thing for the Bears would be drafting Dallas Turner, getting bookend edge rushers like that, because I'm I'm just not really scared of you know what they have in that front seven right now and giving Dallas Turner an option to be opposite Montez Sweat would create a lot of issues for teams and he'd step in and be your day one edge rusher opposite of of Montez so I think Bears fans should be excited about having that I mean Chicago's built on a pedigree of defense that's what their their franchise is known for the Midway Monsters and all these other famous defenses so why not keep adding to it and keep adding athleticism and youth with a pick like Dallas Turner? So the Jets at 10 have Joe Alt fall right into their lap. I think protecting Aaron Rodgers should be priority number one. And, you know, they've done that to a certain extent. They signed Tyron Smith. They traded for Morgan Moses. And, you know, I think they like Elijah Vera Tucker inside. Joe Tittman at center looked really good last year. It's just a matter of do you, you know... Do you trust that that high level of, of age and wear that a lot of those guys have? I mean, Tyron Smith, all sorts of injury issues with the Cowboys. Like, they didn't even know if he would be, you know, a lot of Cowboys fans weren't even sure if he could finish the full year each season. So, you know, it's really up to the Jets. Do they add, do they add that extra tackle? I mean, every team, any team on this on this top 10 would be better with Joe Alt on their team. It's just that simple. So I think the smart move would be taking Joe Alt. You could take Roma Dunes here too and get a receiver opposite of Garrett Wilson. I think a lot of Jets fans realize that there's no real threat on their receiving core outside of Garrett Wilson. And you just signed Mike Williams, but the same goes for him. He's been an injury nightmare for the Chargers the last couple seasons. Seems like he's always dealing with a hamstring or an ankle or some sort of issue. So, you know, either one of these guys would really fill a need and kind of future-proof your lineup for whatever comes next, you know, going forwards. So my personal choice would be to take Joe Alt here and just ensure that Aaron Rodgers has that top level of, of protection around him and you know, if if Tyron Smith gets hurt, it's it's more often not if, it's when Tyron Smith gets hurt, you'll have a guy you can step right in and you won't lose much in terms of competitive ability with that. And, you know, once I think the whole Rodgers thing kind of, whether this is his last season or not, you know, I, I don't know. But once that whole thing kind of blows over, then you can have your, you know, your left tackle of future going forwards. Now, after the Jets have taken Joe Alt, we move on to the Cardinals pick that they acquired from the Vikings. And here, I think that the Cardinals have to draft a difference-making wide receiver since they traded out of that positioning at Marvin Harrison. So, I personally think they'll take Roma Dunze here if the board were to fall this way. And, you know, you get a phenomenal player there. Just amazing jump ball receiver. Crazy, crazy good and crazy good at contested situations outside of the numbers exactly what you're looking for if you're this cardinals team and you know the cardinals if this trade were to happen now have three first round picks this is kind of the similar situation that the the raiders had a few years ago and they totally botched it they didn't really draft anyone special outside of you know they got josh jacobs who's not on the team anymore so the Cardinals can definitely change their fortune by having an amazing first round here based on the draft capital that they have available. So next are the Atlanta Falcons. They quelled their quarterback needs in the offseason by bringing on Kirk Cousins, so we no longer need to hypothesize about what quarterbacks they're looking at. And I think signing Darnell Mooney as well was an underrated signing. It gives them a deep threat that they can you know, threaten the field vertically with and kind of open things up for for B. John Robinson, and now that Arthur Smith is gone, you know, you hope that this playbook becomes more diverse, and we see Bijan get the touch and the reps that he deserves, so I don't really think that the Falcons necessarily need an offensive piece here. Their offensive line is very underrated. It's one of the best in the league, um, so that they don't really have to worry about that here, and a guy that I'm going to draft for them here is Jared Verse. They were heavily connected to Jared Verse last year had he decided to go pro 
and real college football fans will know that Jared Verse probably should have gone to the NFL last year. Phenomenal player. He has such heavy hands for an edge rusher, and you know just the the motor and the the physicality that he plays with is is unmatched by any of the other edge rushers in this class, if you ask me. So I think that the Falcons stick to their evaluation and stick to their guns on this one and take Jared Verse. And, you know, that's kind of what that, that Falcons defensive front is missing is a solid edge rusher like this. Arnold Ebicady hasn't really turned out to be who they wanted. They drafted him in the second round a few years ago, and, you know, they just don't really have anyone that I think suits them going forwards and could be their future game-wrecking edge rusher, you know, and so I think it's a perfect pick for them. Great fit on that defensive line, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Falcons take him here at 12 or at 8. So with the way things worked out, I think the Raiders end up actually staying put here at 13. And, you know, we just, in the past, we haven't really seen the Raiders front office be willing to make moves to kind of trade upwards in the draft so I don't really see them doing that this year and trading up for a quarterback you know when I think they could maybe even they could take Penix in the second round if they want to they have a pretty high second round pick so I think that here they should they should draft by Murphy the second you know they just signed they just signed Christian Wilkins for a huge deal they already have Max Crosby Malcolm Kuntz looks like a really nice edge rusher you know you hope Tyree Wilson can can develop some sort of pass rush move set. We haven't really seen it yet, but they clearly drafted him that high for a reason. He's got amazing traits. And so, you know, adding another freak to this defensive line would be amazing for them. And this Raiders defense is definitely, you know, definitely in an ascending unit that we might see become one of the the better and most improved units in the league this year. So why not add Byron Murphy? And you have a pretty scary interior duo with him and Christian Wilkins at this point so and we already know that they deploy Max Crosby all over that front and and put him in a variety of places that makes it difficult for the offense to to kind of capture him and understand where he's coming from in that defense so I really like that pick and I think it gives the Raiders a lot of juice on that defensive line so the Saints here at 14 this one's really a no-brainer to me they should take Talise Fuaga we just You know, we just got news that Ryan Ramchek is likely going to be lost for the entire season, which is extremely unfortunate considering the situation the Saints' offensive line is. I mean, he's the one piece that you could rely on to be a top performer and protect, you know, the quarterback consistently. And now he they can't even use him for this year. So why not draft Lise Fuaga and insert him to be that right tackle? And, you know, when Ramchek comes back the following season, hopefully, if, you know, he can get the medical stuff figured out, then you can bump Talise Fuaga inside and he can be a phenomenal right guard or left guard for you. There's a lot of analysts that predict that he could be, you know, he's very similar to the way Quentin Nelson plays guard if he were to play inside. So the Saints, it's just like, who else, who else on that line really gives you confidence that they're not going to be you know, kind of, they're not going to be beat by the defensive line. I mean, Cesar Ruiz is a decent guard for sure. But outside of that, it's, you know, they refuse to play Trevor Penning. They they clearly missed on that. And, you know, it sucks because he had such a great pre-draft process with how aggressive he looked in the senior bowl and he was throwing guys around and getting in people's face. And it just doesn't look right when he's out there and, you know, I just think they need a tackle here, especially in the they're in cap hell as well. So they need a tackle and they need to solve that that issue they have on the offensive line. So the Colts here at fifteen, I think, you know, the Colts need to get Anthony Richardson back happy and healthy, first of all. You know, because that that guy is the future of their team and I really think that their offensive line is good enough to protect him if he can if he can avoid a lot of those shots, you know, and be a productive passer back there. So for me personally, I think that the Colts would target one of these corners. Quinya Mitchell is a phenomenal ball hawk out of Toledo. And, you know, there were a lot of questions about his ability to play man, like how he would adjust to that demand of the NFL. Teams want to play man coverage. And he didn't do a whole lot of that at Toledo. He was a very heavy zone quarter. 
You know, he played off the ball quite a bit, off the line of scrimmage. And then he kind of answered all of those questions at the Senior Bowl. He was he was going up against all sorts of receivers there, you know, and during the one-on-ones, and he looked phenomenal. He looked perf- perfectly comfortable in that scenario, and he was being challenged by a lot of those guys. They wanted to go against him because because of the buzz surrounding his name, and, you know, he answered the bell of that. He played super well in those those exercises, and, you know, I really think that's a great determining factor of how a player would, would play at the NFL, you know. You answer to that challenge, a receiver wants to beat you, and, you know, you end up shutting him up. That's a great confidence booster for a corner. So I I think they could go with Quinion Mitchell. I think they love they would love the athletic traits of Terion Arnold as well and the upside he provides. So, you know, for that reason, I think I'm going to go with Quinion Mitchell here and give the Colts that top corner they need. And, you know, I feel like they're always trying to find answers in the secondary. And, you know, they've had some decent secondaries over the years. But... This, this would just put him over the top, and I think Quinion Mitchell is a stud in the making if he gets the proper coaching and the help that he needs with, you know, kind of developing and identifying how, you know, the speed of the game at the NFL level. So the Seahawks here at 16, absolutely going to take Troy Fountainau here. You know, he's an in-state prospect. He's right in the same city. And I think that's actually a pretty underrated thing when you're looking at a prospect. Like, how would a prospect be affected by, you know, moving across the country, moving his whole family across the country? I think Fountainell being in the same city as Seattle, it's it's a free one up. You know, you get to see all of his all of his performances right there next to your your facility, basically. So, you know, bringing him to Seattle, I think, would be very popular among the fans as well. And you know, he's a bit smaller of a tackle, so I project that he's going to be a phenomenal guard in the in the league. And the, the Seahawks have a hole at left guard, so. Fountainau would be the perfect pick here for the Seattle Seahawks. And, you know, if they don't take him here, I guarantee you the Bengals will take him. I guarantee you the Rams would take him. The Steelers would take it. Like, he would get he would get taken immediately. So, with that, the, the Seahawks get a phenomenal player on their, on their front, uh, you know, to, to lead Geno Smith to victory, if you will. So, the Jaguars here at 17. I'm going to take uh, Terry and Arnold for them here. I think they need a corner. They need a difference-making corner. They've got a lot of upside in their front seven with with Josh Allen, and you know they spent the first overall pick on Trevon Walker. So you can hope the, you hope those guys kind of develop. They just signed Eric Armstead as well. So they need to invest in the back end of this defense. And what better way than Terry and Arnold? I think he had a 90 overall PFF grade. Uh, this season, which is very high, and you know he really he kind of overtook his teammate Kool Aid McKinstry to be the top corner on that defense. So very exciting pick if you're a Jaguars fan. You know you you get you you're potentially getting a lockdown corner here who could be a leader in your secondary for years to come. So the Bengals at 18, I will no doubt be picking Jerzon Newton here. I've been fading him a little bit just because he's a much smaller defensive tackle than teams normally take. But he's highly effective. Like he's incredible in the run, and you know the the sack numbers are there too. He got eight sacks last year, and he just he just really from his you know his sophomore year to where he was at two years ago, just the improvement was incredible, and he was immediately a part of that Illinois defense that was so dominant. And the Bengals also lost DJ Reader, who was. The heart and soul of that defensive line, a phenomenal run stopper, very violent and aggressive player. And when you look at Jerzon Newton, he's so similar. Like they're they're very similar in size. You know, they're only about an inch apart in height. Illinois might be, you know, might be upping that number a little bit as teams often do, but they're very similar profile players, and I think you can't just lose a player like DJ Reader and then expect your defense to perform at the same level. That just doesn't happen when you lose a difference-making D tackle like that. So the Bengals getting Jerzon Newton here, amazing. You know, I mean, that's going to do so much for their defense, and he's going to develop very nicely and you know be an answer for them right away. So with the Rams on the clock, I think that right here they need a tackle. They They've got the interior of their defense figured out. You know, they signed Jonah Jackson. I love Steve Avila. He was awesome as a rookie, and I think they're going to move him to center this year. So it'll be interesting to see if he can maintain that level of play he had last year. 
I think he will because he's a phenomenal player. He's a smart player. But, you know, they need a tackle, and I think they can do that here with Olu Fushano. This guy was a consensus top five pick at the beginning of the season, and I don't really know why teams are starting to fade him, why analysts are fading him. But that game against Ohio State where JT Tuimolo kind of pushed him around and may have raised a lot of red flags about his ability to handle power and what are NFL edge rushers going to do to you. They're going to use every move they can to get by you, including power. So I think that the Rams should just just take him here. You're getting a phenomenal player. And he was a guy who would have been a top five pick the year before had he declared for the draft. So I think that this is a phenomenal pick, and it just kind of rounds out what the Rams want to do. Stafford just gets hit way too much. We saw it in the Lions game. You know, he took some shots in that game, and the last thing the Rams want is for a quarterback of that age with his extensive injury history to keep taking hits over and over again. So protect his blind side with Fashanu, and a lot of problems will be solved with how the Rams go about things and you know he needs to develop in the run game that's another big criticism is he's not as aggressive as some of the other tackles in the run game but who 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 better what better coach to to develop that skill set than Sean McVay I mean he's an offensive genius he'll have no problem getting Fashano up to speed with that and developing him in that way so the Steelers here at 20 you know they they need some secondary help I love what they have with Joey Porter Jr. Minka Fitzpatrick's always going to be a dynamic player for them on the back end, but they really need to take one of these two top corners. I mean, Cooper DeGene's the more complete prospect, and you can kind of move him around like a chess piece on that defense, but Nate Wiggins has the better physical tools, and we saw that with his 40-yard dash time. He's a bigger corner. I think he's about 6'1", 6'2", somewhere in there. So it's up to the Steelers. I mean, if they had if they had Nate Wiggins... They'd have another huge corner because Joey Porter's a very tall corner already, and building upon that kind of size that they have back there would be would be great. And this is a defense that's always going to be good when they have T.J. Watt and Cam Hayward. They just signed Patrick Queen. You know they're not going anywhere, but I feel like they've been looking for a corner for so long that it's you know Pat Pete was a good answer for for one season, but you got to have a young corner in there that's going to be ascending through the league. And they did a phenomenal job with picking Joey Porter Jr. That's a great pick, and it's going to age extremely well. But I think that you could, you just got to keep adding to that. So why not take Cooper DeGene here, and you know, you're know you getting a consensus top top player here with this. I mean, every, every analyst has him very high, and we, we all saw what he can do at Iowa, moving around into a lot of different places. And being a part of high-level defenses, too. I mean, Iowa's been no joke for the last three years at, in terms of producing a top-level defense. So with the Dolphins here, I think they should choose Nate Wiggins because of what they lost. You know, I mean, you got Jalen Ramsey on one side, but they did lose Xavier Howard, and they always seem to be kind of banged up in their secondary. So why not take the best corner available, Nate Wiggins, who's honestly probably, you're getting a steal if he falls to 21 because there's a lot of buzz about him going in the top 15 or even being the first corner taken off the board. So with that, it kind of resets the window of of Miami's secondary there, and you know that's a great pick for them going forwards. So the Eagles at 22, I will be drafting, where is he in here? Brian Thomas Jr. for them. In typical Howie Roseman fashion, he's drafting an SEC player in the first round. I mean, Howie has significantly done this over and over again. Like he, he just he basically downloaded the entire Georgia defense from that dominant 2021 season when they won the the national championship. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if they go Brian Thomas here and get a trio of good receivers. And he's kind of he's kind of just a dominant jump ball receiver who can run incredible routes and. Who does that remind you a lot of? That's I mean, they have A.J. Brown on the roster. That's essentially getting another younger A.J. Brown that they can pay a lot less for. So I I would be very happy with that pick if I were an Eagles fan. Analysts are kind of all over the board on Brian Thomas. I mean, Chris Sims just came out the other day and said that he's better than Marvin Harrison Jr., which is not the case at all. But 
analysts seem to fall in love with this guy a lot more than some of the other receivers available at this this kind of area of the draft. And I think that he'd be a great fit at the Eagles, you know, in that Eagles receiving room. They just they just signed Devontae Parker, but you're not going to get anything out of Devontae Parker really more than what the Patriots got out of him or what the Eagles were able to get out of Julio Jones for that stretch last year, you know. And I've always admired the way that how he's been able to to put all the chips on the table and kind of go all in with the Eagles, but still maintain that draft capital and still maintain the ability to build for the future. I mean, they were in the Super Bowl last year after, you know, paying a lot of guys high money, you know, lots of money, and trading for A.J. Brown, one of the top receivers in the league. And they got two first-round picks after that, so they were still able to maintain, you know, the way they spent them was interesting. Obviously, Jalen Carter was a great pick, but, you know, getting Nolan Smith when you're already stacked at edge was, you know, you could have used that pick maybe a little bit better. But I think what Howie's done in Philadelphia is is one of the few examples of being sustainable well, putting everything on the table and being all in well. you have a good competing roster. And, you know, I think adding Brian Thomas Jr. just, you know, further reinforces that philosophy that we've seen over the last couple of seasons from that group. So the Cardinals get their second of their three first round picks here at 23. And, you know, a couple guys, I I think they should really get J.C. Latham because they already have, um, you know, they've got some good things going on that offensive line. It just kind of needs to come together. They drafted Paris Johnson really high last year and he has all the traits necessary to be a dominant left tackle for years so why not get another guy on the other side of him that can be you know an anchor for your future and be a guy who can protect Kyler and you know I mean JC Latham does have some penalty issues he really got flagged a lot at Alabama a lot of Alabama fans kind of you know hate on him for that but I think that once you do this pick, you have two starting caliber tackles at the NFL level, and you have two absolute maulers in the run game as well. So if they decide to draft a new young running back down the line, they'll have a phenomenal start at providing a great offensive line for them. So the Cowboys here at 24, I think, are going to, you know, they just lost Tyron Smith, which is a massive loss. And that's not something you can just kind of, shoehorn another guy in your roster into that position and expect no drop off so for me that's Amarius Mims and the guy is huge he's an absolute house you know the pictures of him next to all the draft reporters at the combine are hilarious because he just towers over all of them and honestly he's he's very similar to Tyron Smith and how you know he's very athletic for a, a guy that big and the Cowboys kind of make smart decisions like this when they need to, to make a change in, in the trenches or, you know, at, at tackle or whatever. So I think they that taking Marius Mims would reset their window on their offensive line and, you know, instantly because right now they're looking at Tyler Smith bumping over to left tackle, which is what he was drafted to do, but he, he was an absolute mauler at left guard last year. So why would you want him to essentially be playing in a situation that's worse for him and expect better things or similar things to Tyron Smith. I think you draft a Marius Mims, insert him right there in a the left tackle, and you know, you keep the rest of your line the way it was last year. I think that that cohesive and cohesion and consistency are what produce a great offensive line. So you know, the the Cowboys the Cowboys need to protect Dak too because they don't really have a lot of options and Jerry's getting older and he wants to win a Super Bowl, so you can't really have your star quarterback go down you know, they might be in a tailspin for a while if that were to happen. So adding Amarius Mims is a huge win in my book for the Cowboys. Now the Packers at 25, I love Leatu Latu. I just don't know that the Packers would necessarily look at him right now. They they do definitely need another edge rusher in that room, you know, considering they, they have some injuries with Kingsley and Igbari being hurt and whatnot, but... I think the Packers, all signs point to them looking at tackle here. And it's between Tyler Tyler Guyton and Graham Barton. And, you know, Tyler Gar- Tyler Guyton's a freak athlete. He's got all of the tools to succeed in the NFL. And 
I have no doubt that he will. However, I just don't know. The Packers don't necessarily have a track record of drafting a guy that huge. Like, it's just, I haven't really seen him draft a tackle this high who's that massive and, you know, just that physically dominant. So I I think Graham Barton is a the guy they'll look at. He just seems like more of a of a guy they'd want to take as a tackle but potentially kick inside to fill one of those guard spots or even be their next swing tackle with uh, Yosh Nyman leaving in free agency. So I'm going to take Graham Barton for them, and that's kind of what the Packers do. They, to the dismay of their fans, they kind of ignore their, you know, they kind of ignore the cries for getting a playmaker like a receiver, like an edge rusher, you know, um, and they kind of take guys that are more developmental linemen that take time or, you know, guys that they feel like would be better at building their future. And I just think that's such a Packers pick right there. That's, I wouldn't surprise me at all if Graham Barton goes to them. So with that, the Buccaneers are up and this is an easy one for me. I think they take Leatu Latu here. I mean, just, you know, Look at the guy's grades. As an edge rusher, this is crazy. You know, 96.3 overall grade is just unbelievable. 94.3 pass rush grade. It it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, the the biggest issue with why this guy is in a top five pick is he had to medically retire from playing football when he was at Washington. I think he had a neck injury that he was dealing with, and the staff just chose to medically retire him, which, you know... <laughs> Consider considering where Washington is at now, like imagine if they had Leatu Latu on that championship team, you know, that championship uh, appearance team. So eventually he does unretire, obviously, and go to UCLA and just have a phenomenal couple of seasons. And you know, just it's just rare to see a, a an edge rusher with this kind of this kind of production, this kind of move set at twenty. And knowing what we know about the Buccaneers, you know, they just. They just released Shaq, Shaq Barrett after, you know, he had an incredible run with them. And I think a lot of Buccaneers fans are going to miss him because he truly is a great player. But I think they found something. They like what they have with Yaya Diaby at the other side. He really had a good se- first season for them. And, you know, they have Joe Tryon Shrink on the other side. He, he's he been solid, but not really necessarily keeping offensive coordinators up at night with his level production. So Leatu Latu would be an instant success in Tampa Bay, especially working with Todd Bowles. He's phenomenal with defensive players. And, you know, I really think that the Buccaneers have a nice set of pass rushers available to them if they were to take Latu here. So now the Cardinals are at 27. And if I were to have three first-round picks like this, I'm going to stack the deck all I can at receiver. I'm going to take A.D. Mitchell here. A blazing fast combine, and he also, you know, I think a lot of his overall size metrics were better than people thought. Like, I think he was taller and weighed more than what Texas was reporting, so that's always a, a positive trend to have rather than the other way around. You know, like Xavier Leggett was listed at six foot three at South Carolina, and you know, he measures in at six foot one. That's a big difference to a lot of GMs and a lot of front offices, so. The Cardinals would get A.D. Mitchell and Roma Dunze. Just, that's just jump ball heaven right there. If you love jump balls, you're going to be seeing that all the time with that duo. And, you know, the Cardinals are able to get a right tackle and two phenomenal receivers. I think that's a great first-round draft. They're paying Kyler. They know who their quarterback is. So, yeah, that's that's just a great scenario for them if that were to play out. So the Bills at 28. I think they just lost so much in their secondary. You know, it would be a very Bills pick to pick a guy like Zach Frazier because they lost Mitch Morrison free agency this year or Jackson Powers Johnson. You know, either of those centers could go to the Bills. I could easily see that happening. But I think they just they need more help in their secondary. So I'm going to be choosing one of these three corners here. And, you know, the one I certainly love the most is TJ Tampa. And I think he's a great, he's just a great corner all around. The tape is there at Iowa State. You can watch him. He's a big hitter. He's a, he's a loud talker. You know, he, he'll get in your face when he makes a play on the ball. And I just love that about him. He's also six foot two, so plenty of size. And 
the Bills already have Razul Douglas on the other side, so they'd have a, a duel of corners that are above six six feet tall and a high level duel of corners at that. So I think TJ Tampa's a very Bills pick here and that that just gives them a starting corner day one, you know, and they lost Trey Trey White as well. So they're gonna have to they're gonna have to accept that they're gonna be using younger players right away and Bills fans might get a little upset that these guys will have learning curves and it'll take time to develop because you don't have Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer back there to to be to save the day anymore. So the Lions at 29, in my opinion, are one of the more kind of unpredictable teams. I mean, last year everyone was ripping on them for taking a running back and a linebacker in the first round and you, you could just see how pumped that front office was to get Jameer Gibbs at 14. Like, at, nobody else was really thinking that was a great pick. And all their guys in their front office war room are just jumping up and down when they get him. So they really trust their internal evaluations and, you know, what they see in a guy. And that's, that's incredibly valuable if you're a, a young ascending team like the Lions are. So, you know, they it's interesting PFF lists center as a need because... Don't they have Frank Rag now, who's one of the best centers in the league? I don't get why that's a need unless there's some sort of contract issue there. But I think that why not be aggressive here and why not take another playmaker in their secondary? You know, they traded for Carlton Davis and they brought in Amik Robertson for the Raiders. But in my opinion, that's not enough. They got a, you know, they can, they kind of just signed DJ Reader, which, you know, it unlocks that front seven. DJ Reader, Aleem McNeil. Aiden Hutchinson, you know, they love James Houston on the other side. Like, that's a great front seven, so why not reinforce the back end and take one of the top corners here? Even, you know, you could even stay with, my, like I talked about earlier, with Troy Fountain out of the, Se- the Seahawks. You could keep Samer still in state. You know, they have all the tape on him because he's playing in the same state as the Lions. So I think either of these corners would be a great pick for them, but I'm going to go with Kool Aid McKinstry. Giving them a top corner, I mean, he was the top dog at Alabama until Terry and Arnold had a late kind of surge past him, but there's there's years of high-level tape on Kool-Aid McKinstry. He's a great receiver, or a great corner, and I think he would fit well into what the Lions want to do, and, you know, he'd re- reunite with his former Alabama teammate, Brian Branch, back there, so expect good things if the Lions were to take another corner and just kind of stack that room as much as they can. And with the Ravens here at 30, this is where I would consider taking Jackson Powers Johnson. And I've been fading him really hard because he's just not as high on, you know, the consensus big boards as he is here on PFF. And I just think the league thinks lower of him than a lot of people in the media and a lot of a lot of fans might think of him. So I'm not going to be surprised at all if he falls to the the late first round or even the early second round. But the Ravens lost so much on their offensive line. I mean, they, I think they lost both of their guards. So they really need to to figure something out, you know, on the interior line. And obviously they have their center of the future in Tyler Linderbaum, but maybe you can move Powers Johnson to guard or, you know, figure out what works best with him. So, I'm going to do that. You can never have enough good offensive linemen. And I know it's kind of dumb drafting two centers, but they can move Powers Johnson around. They can make him a right or a left guard. And you're still getting a phenomenal player. I mean, he is he is massive. He's built like a, like a house, like I said earlier about some um, about Amarius Mims. So with that, we move on to the Niners here. And the Niners have always been a team that basically, they basically just look for the top defensive linemen I mean that's what they play their identity through is having a crazy front seven that can get after it no matter the down you know they they love to have that aggressive level of pass rush that can hit the quarterback without bringing help from the secondary or without bringing linebackers so I know they've done a lot in free agency you know signing signing a few guys here and there and I just I don't think the Niners break tradition here. Obviously, their off their offensive line is aging fast. Trent Williams is still Trent Williams, but there's a lot of other question marks there. It just it just hasn't mattered. It doesn't matter how old the Niners line is. 
CMC still goes off for you know hundreds of yards each game each game it seems so I I just think they continue with that that trend here and would take either Braden and Fisk or Braswell you know you could go with the power rush here of Chris Braswell which would fit very well with the Niners but if you do that you're kind of you're kind of doubling back on the Drake Jackson pick from a few years ago I think they really had high hopes for Drake Jackson when they got him in the second round and they thought he would be much better but injuries have kind of limited his ability to develop and now they're signing guys right over the top of them you know like they signed Leonard Floyd they signed Yatur Gross Matus from the uh the Carolina Panthers so I just don't know that drafting Chris Braswell he, and you know they lost Chase Young too so you can make an argument there but I think Braden Fisk fills a bigger need for them Hyper athletic defensive lineman was an absolute monster at Florida State, and they just lost Eric Armstead, who was such a huge part of what they do on that defensive line. I mean, he really played a lot of different positions. Like they had, they would even have him at edge rusher next to to Nick Bosa sometimes. So why not get another defensive lineman and keep contributing to who you are as a as a franchise? Like that's what John Lynch and the 49ers front office have done time and time again. Just take whatever you know, beast is available for your front seven. It do, it just doesn't matter who they have on their, you know, their front seven. It's going to be an aggressive unit. And so I think that that trend will continue here. And what better way to do that than Braden Fisk? So with the last pick in the first round, I think it's, you know, it's no doubt the Chiefs need a receiver. Like, it's kind of just Rasheed Rice and... Who else? Who else are you scared of? I'm not scared of Kadarius Tony. You know, I'm not scared of Justin Watson or any of those other guys, really. Justin Ross is there, but if he ever plays, you know, I don't think Justin Ross will ever see the field just because of the injury concerns that he has. So, I don't know. I think that if Tyler Guyton weren't on the board here, who is just a freak, freak athlete at tackle, has all the ability to succeed at the next level, and the Chiefs would be great at developing him too. They look at what they've gotten out of the other guys on their offensive line. So I think Tyler Guyton's the pick here. You could go Lad McConkey, who's probably the second best route runner behind Malik Neighbors, behind you know Marvin Harrison Jr. So it's up to you. I know Chiefs fans really really want a receiver for sure. Troy Franklin would also fit very well with what they do. But I, I think Tyler Guyton's the best fit here. And that way you don't have to be forced to bring back Donovan Smith on a one-year deal. You know, you, we've already seen that Donovan Smith is, he's a reliable tackle, but he gets beat every once in a while. And they need to just get a young left tackle that they can trust to protect Mahomes for the next, you know, five, six years if they wanted to. So, yeah, that wraps up this first round draft. And, you know, overall, I think it's it's just so random. It's hard pr- to predict, you know, if anybody knew what would happen on draft night, then it wouldn't be interesting. So that's that's all the fun in these, these mock simulators is just kind of building what you think could happen. And, you know, feel free to let me know in the comments what you think. If I did a horrible job at, at something, let me know about it. I love to hear that and love to see what I could have done better on this. But... You know, there's definitely teams who who I didn't trade with here or didn't move around that could definitely move on, you know, draft night. Like like I said, I just don't trust the Raiders to move up for a quarterback, but they very well could prove me wrong and, and want to leapfrog the Broncos to get Bo Nix or Penix or whoever they see that, you know, they think could be the best for them. So, yeah, definitely subscribe for more content like this. I'm going to keep making mock drafts and keep doing this kind of content. So, yeah, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.